Hey, I'm Kev K, I'm Mr. Kerr, and welcome to the first episode of my seven part look back at the 2015 Verizon IndyCar series season has. In these episodes, we're going to be looking at the teams and drivers who took part in the 2015 season, beginning with Dale Coin Racing and the Indy 500 one off efforts in this episode. But before we get into that, Firstly, what was the 2015 Verizon IndyCar Series season? Well, it was a mixed bag for IndyCar in 2015, as all the talk pre-season was about these area kits finally getting introduced to the series after being part of the proposal which brought the DW12 to the series in 2012. The area kits had got delayed, delayed, and this was due to fears of cost, particularly for the team owners, but they finally got forced through in 2015. And the original proposal of the error kits was, you know, actually very sound, as at the turn of this decade, IndyCar suffered with the Spec Series tag with Dallara and Honda supplying things. But the error kits was meant to help the series move away from that by opening up a floor to manufacturers to design their own error kits on which to put upon the DW12 tub. And the teams were allowed to pick and choose whatever manufacturer's error kit they wanted, regardless of who their engine manufacturer was. Unfortunately, by 2015, no one had stepped up to the plate, and so Chevrolet and Honda, the engine suppliers, were forced to make these aero kits, and the teams were forced to use whichever aero kit their engine manufacturer made. Well, the Chevrolet teams certainly got the bright end of that deal, and particularly after St. Pete, where we saw Penske dominate qualifying and the race, we were perhaps question, oh, maybe there could be a one-team domination in IndyCar. That's unsinkable. And it certainly was in the end as well. In qualifying, Penske was certainly cream of the crop. Races were a different matter in tidy, as once again we saw some fantastic racing this year. Perhaps the least exciting of the DW12 era since 2012, but still some fantastic racing nonetheless. Has the era kits are still, you know, very much criticised after the season, got criticised throughout the season, particularly from some team owners and. You know, I was very in on the aero kit bandwagon, you know, before the season had begun. I was excited to see these cars go fast with the increased downforce around the road and street courses in particular and set that records like they did throughout 2015, matching the late era champ cars from about a decade ago. But as Scott Dixon pointed out in the off-season, you know, overtaking was a bit harder for the drivers with more dirty air behind the cars, meaning it was harder to follow the cars through the corners and, you know, produce less overtaking. And Scott Dixon even went as far as saying the hurry kits were unnecessary, just heaping burden on the team owners, of course, and on the teams of figuring out these error kits, which also lessened the competition between the teams, as some teams figured it out you know, better than others during the year. And while I agree with kind of all of Scott Dixon's points, I wouldn't say the you know, error kits were kind of unnecessary. As I said, you know, I'm excited to see these cars go fast. I'm excited to see, we can tell the difference now between the Chevrolet and Honda quite clearly. But let's see how it goes in 2016, how the development of these aero kits are and see how Honda does by, you know, IndyCar have given them a helping hand there. Let's see if they've matched Chevrolet this year and hopefully have some good competition between the two manufacturers this year on the aero kit side as well on the engine side. So, aero kits still up in the air, what we think about them after the 2015 season. But as I said, there was some fantastic racing. The madness had no with the rain and funding qualifying, meaning that had to be cancelled. And in the race, you know, still raining, you know, still a very wet track. But in the end, we had some fantastic racing and a surprise winner in James Hinchcliffe in only second race with Smith Peterson Motorsport. Then we had some more fantastic racing at Alabama with some mixed up strategies, in particular, seeing Graham Ray all come through the field. And then at the Indy 500, as fantastic as always. So we saw one Pablo Montoya put in a fantastic drive, perhaps the best drive since his return to IndyCar last year or two years ago now, where he just drove through the field and in the last reckonings beat his teammate Will Power to grab his second Indy 500 win ahead of the Chip Ganassi's as well of Scott Dixon and even Charlie Kimball getting involved in the end. And then we had more madness with the duel in Detroit, more rain, scar in the weekend, and also providing some surprise winners again as another rookie winner in Carlos Munoz grabbed his first win after Joseph Newgarden had grabbed his first win 
in Alabama. And we also saw the return of a veteran there winning in Sebastian Bourdais and being very much on form this season, the Frenchman. And then we'll get into the oval section and it's very up and down. Down in Texas once again where they can't really figure out how to do racing there. But at Fontana we had an edge of our seat, butt clenching, blinking your mystic, it takes your breath away, action. At Fontana it was a race you'll never forget in a million years if you're an IndyCar fan and watched it. One minute you were gasping at a fantastic move, another you were gasping at near miss and in the end the race did unravel unfortunately into incidents but it was just you know a fantastic race and a good job from IndyCar to take Fontana off the calendar this year. We don't want any more excitement of course. And then we also had some madness at Iowa once again the last few laps of the race turned into a video game when we saw Ryan Hunter Ray return the winning ways after having a miserable season for the most part but he got it back together in the last quarter of the season and then we saw some exciting racing at mid ohio before we went to pocono and saw eight wide action at times but unfortunately of course the race has been overshadowed by the incidents which claim the right claim the life of justin wilson and you know we've heard all about the obituaries how fantastic a person he was the gentle giant of indycar and of course he leaves a big hole in the indycar community heading into this year and beyond but after all it was said and done at Sonoma we had a title battle on our hands between the old enemies Chip Ganassi and Penske, Juan Pablo Montoya and Scott Dixon and once again we had a familiar ending as the Penske team just fell apart while the Chip Ganassi team rallied around Scott Dixon with Tony Khan, Charlie Kimball, even Sebastian Savage chipping in to help Scott Dixon win that race and grab the title at the last from their old enemy it was tense race and it was not no great overtaking but it's just very tense you know he was not decided until the last corner of the last lap it went right up to the wire and it was a very fitting finale after you know a terrible beginning to the week of course and so indycar headed ended you know kind of on a high note there with that finale at sonoma and you know, that week kind of summed up IndyCar in 2015 was very up and down this year. And I only even talked about Indy 500 practice and qualifying where Chevrolet turned up with an inefficient aero kit, while Honda turned up with a pretty decent one, but in qualifying chimney, chim, trim even, the Chevrolet aero kit was just too unstable, leading the cars flipping all over the place. And of course, we had the near fatal accident of James Hinchcliffe as well impelled by a suspension piece but we can never be you know thankful enough for the quick work of the uh, Matro safety crew throughout all of the years they have been with IndyCar and particularly in that moment saving the life of the Canadian with some brilliant work to stop the bleeding and you know save his life and now he's back training and he's gonna be back this year Hinchcliffe so it was a bit, as I said very up and down for IndyCar it has there's lots of controversy about that Indy 500 you know weekend leading to qualifying on race three. you know Honda not very happy being punished you know for Chevrolet's mistakes a bit like you know a decade ago in F1 when everyone got punished for mission in coming up with tyres that couldn't you know handle that load of that final corner of that Grand Prix circuit but you know up and down for IndyCar in 2015 hopefully 2016 is a bit better with the turn of classic racetracks in Phoenix in Road America and with the Boston Street course as well another tricky kind of course for the IndyCar drivers to navigate there so that's my summary of 2015 let me know in the comment section below what your summary is of the 2015 Verizon IndyCar series season but now let's get into the meat and bones of these reviews and let's begin with the minnows in IndyCar Dell Coin Racing still produced two cars for the whole of the season despite obvious money issues as highlighted by the rotational drivers the team had in the early part of the year. The veteran team owner who waited 25 years for finally grabbing his first Verizon IndyCar Series win while his team never looked like hitting those heights in 2015. A few top 10 finishes is perhaps just reward for the Batmarker team in the Verizon IndyCar series as they struggled to get on top of this 
aero kits. You know, the Honda aero kits particularly difficult in the first part of the season, but by the end of the year, they did appear to be a bit faster. Unfortunately, it was the last two races of the season, so it really didn't affect their season as a whole, but it's encouraging for them heading into 2016, which will hopefully be a much better year for the team with a very good driver in their car in Connor Daly for the whole of the season. While in 2015 had a bit of a up and down driver arrangement there as they began the year with the number 18 occupied by Carlos Hurtas and the number 19 occupied by Francesco De Arconi. And for Hurtas who grabbed the last win for Dale Coyne in 2014 in Houston a bit with an illegal car with a bigger fuel tank than normal and illegal wings but in the IndyCar series, it doesn't matter if you win with an illegal car, you just get fined the few days afterwards. A bit of a meme for the series. But for Hurtas, that was the high point of a very average rookie year. As he grabbed a few top 10 finishes, but never looked like he was particularly comfortable in IndyCar, particularly on the ovals, where he had lots of retirements at the end of the year, where he was just so uncomfortable in the car on the ovals, but at least at the Indy 500 he qualified the car well. Unfortunately he had to withdraw due to an inner air infection, so Tristan Volce took over that car for the race, and Hurtos hasn't been seen or heard from since, it seems like, for the rest of the year, and he knows like that may be the end of his IndyCar career. As he had three starts this year at NOLA, at the Indy GP, and at St. Pete. His best start was 23rd at the Indy GP and 24th at St. Pete at Noda, while his best finish was 16th at Noda and 19th at the Indy GP, as he finished two races, none on the lead lap. So his stats on paper look abysmal, as he had one retirement in St. Pete with steering issues, never really got going there. And for Hurtos, I do wonder where he's going to go now, as I said, he didn't really look in sync with IndyCar during his time in the series and it doesn't look like Dale Coyne will hire him for 2016 or no one will. So maybe sports cars has, it seems like if you're a young single seater driver whose career is stalled that's where you go now. It's very good for sports cars but you know a bit of an indictment on single seater racing. So for Hurtos, yeah he's Perhaps a driver in his career is showing he had, does have high points, does have talent, but has never really put a full season together. So I do wonder where we see him end up next. As I said at the beginning of the year, alongside Hurtas was Francesco Giacconi, the 31-year-old Italian who was returning to IndyCar after a couple of races with Conquest Racing in 2010 before four very average years spent in AutoGP. Well, he proved in 2015 was a bit of a facepalm of a driver and hopefully he never returns to the series as the Italian was miserably off the pace, was getting an array of drivers, in particular in Long Beach when getting the laps. He was just he, sometimes even racing them, it seemed like, and just ignoring blue fags or just ignoring the calls on the radio to move out of the way. He had no sense, it seemed like, in his time in the Verizon IndyCar series. As he competed in five races, the first five of the year and he ran three races at the end with two retirements to have an engine issue in St. Pete and a crash at Noda. Remember he got taken out by Harry Castro Nevis perhaps to the relief of everyone else in the field. Actually in a crash that wasn't his fault at all for Drea Coney but his best start was 22nd at Long Beach, 23rd at St. Pete, Noda in Alabama and 25th at the Indy GP. His best finish was 21st at Long Beach, 22nd at the Indy GP and 23rd at Alabama. So his average start and finish are absolutely abysmal and I do feel sorry that Delcoin had to employ such a useless driver last year and as I said hopefully he never returns to the Verizon IndyCar series. Certainly the worst rookie or worst driver we've seen in the Verizon IndyCar series since the days of Milka Juno. Not to mention some of his comments on social media during the year were, well... I'm not sure his intelligence is that high, particularly his comments towards Carmen Jordan at the beginning of the year. Bit pot in the kettle black there. But let's move on to a driver who's actually good and decent in Connor Daly, who had his only stop of the year for Delcoin at Long Beach, subbing in after Rocky Moran 
Jr. broke his thumb in second Friday practice when at the first corner, I think he got into an altercation with Carlos Munez, went into the tie wall holding the steering wheel and unfortunately broke his thumb. But walking around Jr. being in that seat was a surprise to everyone, came out of the blue. The American last drove in a single seat about a decade ago in Formula Atlantics and done some sports car racing since then, but had generally not done much driving in the past few years. So for Mark Aran Jr. to be in that seat was a big surprise, but for Gonna Daily it was an even bigger surprise that he turned up on Friday, you know, just to spectate. But on Saturday he was in the car for one practice session before doing qualifying and then doing the race as well, where he started 21st and finished 17th on the lead lap. And what a fantastic job the young American did in very difficult circumstances, having to get adjusted to the car so quickly and in the end putting in a very tidy race together you know no real mistakes that we saw and he didn't even put the car on the wall either so you can't ask for much more from a substitute there and obviously I'm hoping he does even better for Dale Coyne in 2016. After the Indy 500 the number 18 car settled into a driver lineup as on the road in street courses there was a Adolfo Gonzalez who was a bit unimpressive in GB2 a few years ago but Show himself to be competent in IndyCar last year as he finished 26th in the stands with one top 10 finish and 94 points. He competed in six races, finished four of them, and finished all of those races on the lead lap. The most lead lap finishes for a Dell Coin racing driver in 2015. His best start was 21st at Alabama, 22nd in the Detroit races at Mid Ohio, and 23rd at Toronto. His best finish was 9th in Sonoma, 18th in Toronto and 20th in Alabama and Mid-Ohio. His average start and average finish was outside of the top 30, kind of the norm for a Dell Coin racing driver last year, unfortunately. And his two retirements happened in Detroit as he had a rear hub failure in the first race after touching the wall and a crash in the second race. Bit of a miserable weekend for the Venezuelan. But he did lead five laps in Toronto when Del Coin went on a different strategy, stayed out after a caution period. But he was calm, he didn't make any mistakes, he didn't fluster at all at being in the lead of a race. Even though he wasn't rewarded with a great result there in 18th, he highlighted those qualities again in the season finale in Sonoma. As with all eyes on the battle at the front, there was perhaps an even bigger battle right at the back as the number 18 entry was battling to get into the leader's circle which was established in 2002 it was a basically a fun to keep alive teams to keep them going you know keep entries going into the verizon indycar series back then when it was battling against carter of course and in 2015 i believe it was the top 21 entries that get into this leaders leaders circle and the minimum reward for being in the leaders circle was increased at the beginning of 2015 from 1 million to 1.25 million dollars significant part of the funding for an entry of these kind of smaller teams so you know it, it was basically the difference between having an entry for 2016 or not having an entry in 2016 and to earn entrant points well as i said the number 18 car that's an entry so whoever drives that car scores points for that entry and you know it's a bit like in f1 whoever drives that second car you know scores points in say the constructors standards i hope that makes it a bit clearer so by having a number of drivers in a number 18 car you know Gonzalez was fighting for all of those drivers for that entry to get into that leaders circle ahead of the number four driven by Stefano Coletti of KVSH racing and you know Dale Coyne called the strategy right in a race that needed it to be called right it was all about that you know it's a very tense race not much overtaking going on and they called it right and Gonzalez drove a very calm and ominous race really to a top 10 finish he had some pressure near the end of the race but once again just like in Toronto just looked unflustered and drove a superb race to get into that leader's circle ahead of the number four entry and you'll never guess what's happened in 2016 it looks like the number four entry is not going to be a full season effort at least maybe not even seen at all and you know that just highlights how important that drive was from Gonzalez. So heading into the air, you know, a bit skeptical about seeing Gonzalez in an Indy car, but I think in 2015 he I wouldn't he showed that I wouldn't mind seeing him perhaps on a road and street course in a few races in 2016. Let's see what happens to him. As in the number 18 for the Ovals was the English woman Pippa Mann, who actually drove in the number 63 car at the Indy 500, you know, supporting the Susan Komen 
cancer charity there and having a superb fundraising effort around there, highlighting how much of an ambassador Pippa Man is and, you know, out of the car. But in the car, she drove six races in 2015, finished four of those races at the finish, only one lead that finish, though, on her way to 29th in the standings with 76 points. Her best start was 17th at Pocono, 22nd at Texas, Fontana and Iowa, and 23rd at Milwaukee. Her best finish was 13th at Fontana and Pocono, 17th in Texas, and 22nd at the Indy 500. Average start and average finish are 33rd and 34th out of the 40 drivers that participated in 2015, and her two retirements were due to handing issues in Milwaukee and Iowa. And I'm not sure during her overrun she really just stood out and perhaps showed why she's just an Indy 500 only entrant really has since, you know, graduating from Indy Lights a few years ago where she did quite well, you know, won races. But, you know, in IndyCar she's never really had a great opportunity until this chance in 2015. Of course, you know, very difficult circumstances just hopping into the car on ovals and, you know, with a very small team as well but yeah just not sure she showed enough really to be rewarded with more races in 2016 than the indy 500 has that time she was you know quite level with volce and that's what you kind of expect you know that's what that's you can't ask more than that you know especially with as i said perhaps the back marker entry for 2015 but yeah i'm just not not sure about her as a driver i would say in indy car Perhaps just an Indy 500 only entry, unfortunately. That does pay me to say that. But it will be interesting to see her plans in 2016. So let's move on to the other drivers for the number 19 entry. And for the Indy 500, James Davidson drove the car. But the Australian missed qualifying. Volce qualified the car. And so when he stepped in the car, he got put to the back of the field due to someone else qualifying it. And unfortunately, he started the last and retired on lap 116 as a result of crash damage after colliding with Volge in pit lane. Yeah, not the best thing to happen on the biggest stage in IndyCar. But I'm a bit of a fan of the Australian and I do hope we see him in the 100th Indy 500 this year. Has, after the Indy 500, Tristan Volce, the Frenchman who drove the number 18 car in the Indy 500, took over the car for the rest of the season. He finished 22nd in the final stands with one top 5 finish and two top 10 finishes with 175 points in the end. He competed in 11 races, ran 8 races at the finish with only 3 lead lap finishes. His best start was 11th in the first race in Detroit, 13th at Pocono, 16th at Texas and 20th at Fontana, Milwaukee in Iowa. While his best finish was 4th in the second race in Detroit, 6th in Mid-Ohio, 12th in Iowa and 16th in Milwaukee. His average start was 32nd but his average finish was the only you no know, Dell Coin racing driver kind of statistic to not be in the bottom 30 being 28th. His three retirements were a crash at the Indy 500 and at Pocono where he just turned his brain off and took out Graham Rayhold. Still don't know what he was thinking there and a will be an issue at Texas. He also led 10 laps at mid-Ohio. Again, a bit off strategy. You know, cautions fell the right way for Dale Coyne there. But a night Gonzalez in Toronto, you know, Volte was rewarded with a very good finish in mid-Ohio with sixth place. You know, again, a bit under pressure at the end there, Dale Coyne racing driver, but he drove really well. And particularly in that second race in Detroit where we saw a number of drivers, you know, drive really well, particularly with like Connor Daly in that Smith Peterson Motorsports car in a few laps and getting a top 10 finish. Well, Volce drove even better than him in the end, well, to a better result at least. You know, finishing in fourth place in a Delcoin racing car in a tricky conditions, caught out even some of the big guys in the series, but he just kept going to the end to finish fourth. So, fantastic drive from the Frenchman, the 2012 Indy Lights champion. He had a bit of a difficult rookie season in 20. 13 with Smith Peterson Motorsports missed the 2014 season. Was doing the Road to Indy TV, you know, great YouTube channel, you know, covering the Mazda Road to Indy series, you know, all three of them. And, you know, he was very good in that job, but I want to see him in an Indy car. We definitely saw that in 2015. A very welcome return to the Frenchman to the cockpit. And I hope we see him in 2016. Hopefully, as the second driver for Delcoin alongside. Connor Daly, but there's always a difficulty about sponsorship and funding, you know, for almost every car in the Verizon IndyCar series. Unfortunately, that's a big downside for the sport with it being very niche 
at the moment apart from the Indy 500. So I really hope we see Volche in an IndyCar in 2016 as he did highlight in 2015 that he did, does deserve a second shot in IndyCar. But as we have seen with J.R. Hildebrand in particular, sometimes once you're out of the game, it's very difficult to get back in, even if you do have a few races and some very good races as Hildebrand has had in that Ed Comter racing or CFH racing machine in recent years. So hopefully for Volche, he doesn't you know, go by the wayside once again. Really do hope he ends up in an Indy car as he was the best Delcoin racing driver in 2015. Almost ran out of breath talking about Delcoin. There has we noticed out a fifth of the drivers who took part in the 2015 Frozen Indy car series season. But now we're going to be looking at the drivers who took part in only one race in 2015. The greatest spectacle in race in the Indy 500. And we're going to firstly look at a driver who's more known as a commentator now. In America, but once again, Townsend Bell showed that he can pedal an IndyCar really well. So, the number 24 John and Rumble Kingdom Racing car, and they really did play up that number as they paid tribute to Jeff Gordon, who was in his last year of racing in NASCAR and who was the pace car driver for the Indy 500. There was also Townsend Bell's eye catching dress sense as well during the month of May, but he certainly showed he was eye catching in an Indy car, still has he started 23rd and finished 14th on the lead that never quite having the pace for even a top 10 finish in the end as he was kind of flirting with it for most of the race. But it's fantastic to see the Californian not being slowed down after turning the big 4-0 the month before the Indy 500. It was a big year for Bell has he had his first go at the Mon, finishing third in class in the GTE Am. And he also won the GTD class in the WeatherTech, I believe it is now, Sports Car Championship, the IMSA Championship. And what a year it was for Townsend Bell in 2015. Hopefully he has a good one in 2016 as well. And we see him in the Indy 500 once again. And on to the Jonathan Birds Racing with KV Racing Technology number 88 entry for Brian Clawson, the dirt track open wheel racer by trade, a multiple USAC, USAC midget and USAC sprint car champion. Well, he has had the greatest time of it in the Indy 500. As in his previous go at it in 2012 with Surfish Hartman Racing, he retired early on in the race. And unfortunately, in 2015, he started 30th and retired with a crash on that 61. As he moved over for the leaders, got into the grey and then got into the wall. But he is going to return in 2016 with Jonathan Birds Racing for the 100th Indy 500. And for Clawson to be there, perhaps one of the greatest legacies for Randy Bernard. As around the turn of the decade, Clawson was highly rated. He drove in the NASCAR Xfinity Championship for Chip Ganassi Racing as he was a Chip Ganassi development driver. But, you know, he went to the open wheel side beginning with 2011 and... I really hope he can finish the 2016 Indy 500. He really does deserve it after having a hell of a time with it in 2012 and, of course, in 2015. So that leaves uh, the Zier Partners Racing number 91 entry for Buddy the Zier, which unfortunately did not qualify for the Indy 500. Has the 1996 Indy 500 winner said, We missed a whole day of practice. We were rained out the other day. We missed practice on Thursday. We got a late start. And you're a small effort, you're really going to be up against it. The Zero said an upright and axle broke on the car. And by the time he got in line for qualifying, it was nearly too late. And right now, he and his partners are trying to build the race into, into a point where he can eventually step out of the car and have a younger driver race for the team. But the Zero is still in that process of getting the team to that point. As he said, my guys did a heck of a job given the very few tours we Gave them to work with. It was a late start. It wasn't funded as well as it should be. If we come back funded well, then we can threaten the front few rows of the grid. Well, that's the goal anyway, to make that another return to the Indy 500 and have another shot at winning the Indy 500. Just not like this, he said. I hope so. Owner and sponsor winning. As Azir's crew made several changes ahead of that second run, no speed leaning the rear ring back to a crazy negative amount in the hopes of finding more speed. But unfortunately, the Zier ended up a couple miles per hour short of making the show with a 220.153 mile per hour run. But hopefully you will see the Zier return for the 100th running of the Indy 500. 20 years 
after you won the greatest spectacle in racing. So that's the end of a packed first episode as we note that over a quarter of the drivers who took part in the 2015 season. There's only six more episodes to go and in the second one is a bit less packed as we look at four drivers from two teams, AJ Foy Enterprises and Brian Herter Autosport. So, so now for watching and I will see you then.